My name is Sarah Mana Scalco Robinson, and I'm the founder of the Iowa Veterans Perspective. I mainly started the Iowa Veterans Perspective because I wanted to share the stories of our veterans. I come from a long history of veterans. My grandpa was in World War II. My dad was in the Iowa National Guard for more than 41 years with a deployment to Afghanistan. And my sister is a Blackhawk pilot with two deployments to Iraq. I joined the Iowa National Guard when I was 18 years old as a broadcast journalist. At that young age, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I'm so glad that I did. My husband and I have both been in the Iowa National Guard for more than 20 years each. I still love making videos and I love teaching my young soldiers how to tell stories. I think one of my big dreams for this project would be being able to share these stories with a larger audience. I love telling the stories of what they did in their time in service, but I also love telling the story of what they did after they got back. I love being able to share those inspirational stories of veterans who have dealt with adversity and overcome that. And I want to show that to other people who may be struggling, either other veterans or just people in our community. So being able to share the rest of the story and having a larger audience of people to say, wow, I had no idea that veterans were such a big part of our community. I feel like that's important because not just teaching people how to have gratitude or to be inspired, perhaps to disparage rumors out there about what it is to be a veteran. I think far too often the general population thinks that veterans are white men that were in World War II, when in fact veterans come in all shapes and sizes and genders and colors. And I want to show that amazing diversity that we have in today's military. I had to learn the hard way that self-care is important because far too often anyone who runs any business or pretty much anyone that is adulting on a daily basis finds themselves overwhelmed and that's what was happening to me. I found myself being completely consumed not just by the work itself but by the veterans stories. It's really hard to sit there and hear someone's stories of struggle and hear about a day that changed their life and not take that home with you. I found myself having nightmares. I found myself replaying their stories over and over in my mind because when you're editing a video, you are playing it over and over again. And the quotes and the emotions are burned into your memory. Imagine sitting in your home office with your kids in the next room, looking through video of dead bodies being piled up or looking through video of battles and that kind of thing. And so then I finally said, you know, I need to start putting myself first and I need to start putting my family first. But also I learned that mental health and physical health are directly related. So I started working out more and taking that time to do meditation, yoga, eating healthier. I try to stay away from those common coping mechanisms that a lot of people go to in order to have self-care. The weekend after September 11th, I traveled to Davenport on my National Guard drill weekend. As a part of the story, I interviewed a Chinook pilot named Chief Warrant Officer Bruce Smith. And it was, it was a quick interview. I didn't really think anything of it. Chief Smith later died in combat in a Chinook crash in Iraq. He had that interview that he was able to speak from beyond the grave, and I was able to share that with people. I was able to share that with his family so that they could remember him saying things like that he loved being a pilot and he wouldn't want to do anything else. And so that turned into wanting to tell the story for people who can't do it themselves. Either they don't know how or they're no longer with us. Sometimes they'll share a story with me that they said they've never even told their own wives. Why are they sharing this with me, you know, all these years later, a total stranger? And then I realize it's because they know I'm a veteran. They want to tell me their story because to them, I'm, I'm another veteran that they can trust. And I have this unique ability to just sit and talk and ask just the right questions where I get the credibility of, okay, you're a veteran too, I can share this with you and it's safe. 
I make these amazing videos about people's lives so that 50 years from now, you can hear about what it was like during the Battle of the Bulge because of the first person perspective. You can't get that from a book or a movie to actually see the person who was there telling the story. And so that's what my goal is, is for people to have a better appreciation of what it is to be a veteran and have the general population continue to rally behind our veterans and continue to rally behind our country so that we can appreciate some of the freedoms that we have and appreciate the people who gave us those freedoms and to understand the cost of those freedoms are all over the faces of our veterans and the stories that they share. Hi everybody, thanks for logging on to my breakout session. I hope you just enjoyed that video. I am a firm believer that a picture says a thousand words and I could sit here for the next hour and try to tell you that story that was just summed up in about six minutes or less. You're gonna see a lot of videos today because pretty much that's what I do. I'm not here really to talk about myself. I'm here to inspire you and share stories of our veterans and hopefully maybe you might learn a little bit about history while we're at it. I originally got my start interviewing veterans at the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum probably about 10 years ago. It was just a small project, but they asked me to interview POWs from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And I thought, well, yeah, sure, I know how to make a video. I'll, I'll help out with this little project. But to say that this project changed my life is really an understatement. I spent the next several months interviewing veterans who told me about just atrocities of their lives. One that really stands out to me is Larry Spencer who lives over in Earlham and he lived in the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam for seven years and he pretty much just told me about what it was like to live in isolation and how great it was when they started having the prisoners be able to interact with each other a little bit more. Everybody that I talk to is so frazzled and so strung out and so tired and they just don't have anything left in them. Between homeschooling kids, trying to run a business from home, just the, the lackluster look that I get from people. And right now, perfect example, I'm staring at a video camera in my she shed and I am not enjoying this part of it. I love the feeling of a big crowd and I love seeing people's faces and interacting with them. So this to me is a very cold way of doing a presentation, but it's better than not doing any presentation at all. So during the presentation today, as we're going through, I encourage you, if you have any questions or wanna reach out or have any comments, just go over into the comment section and I'm on the other end, a real person, and I'll answer your questions as we go. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open up to questions if you do wanna to talk to me in person and I will answer anything that you wanna know also. But enough about me. I'm here today to share some stories with you about some of the veterans that I've met during my travels. Today we're going to talk about what it is to be bold and what it is to do a little bit extra. I had the honor of doing a full-length documentary called The Men of the Second Mech up in Sioux City. I traveled up there on a weekend and did probably about a dozen interviews in that weekend. And they took me on a journey from small town Iowa all the way to Vietnam and back again just in that short time. And I learned so many lessons from them. I learned lessons from all the veterans that I interview, but one really stood out to me during this time. His name's Rich Huseman, and he's a friend of mine now after I interviewed him and did this project. And he taught me what it truly means to do just that little bit of extra in your community and why he chose to do a little bit extra. The engineers had just completed two bunkers out of plywood and, and the walls are three foot thick and they put uh, gravel and rock and whatever concrete in those walls. But I was uh, assigned to uh, be on a bunker guard on bunker 13. I offered a guy money to trade places because the fighting position I was gonna be on was, was a pile of sandbags, rotting sandbags. And I didn't consider that to be as safe as a brand new bunker. It was common knowledge then is, is that if you're on perimeter guard, you stand guard either on top or behind. 
because RPGs would penetrate and then explode inside. Early in the morning, about three in the morning, there was four of us on, on per bunker and one of the guys poked me. Did you hear that? And out in the distance in the wire, we could hear in English, hey GI, you awake? I was standing behind the bunker at that time and they fired an RPG at our position. And I remember seeing it, it was like a ball of fire coming at me. Well, it hit sandbags in front of me. It wounded several of the guys that I was with, just knocked me down. The bunker I wanted to go to, where this Wendell Weston was, they were inside the bunker, all four of them. And they hit it with an RPG and all four were killed. I can't forget that because a guy I wanted to switch places with and offered him money died instead of me. Why did I survive? And maybe that's why I've, I've been involved so much with my community and, and doing different things. That um, you gotta do that extra because you were spared, you gotta do that extra. No, oh, I'm doing the extra. Well, if that doesn't get you motivated to get out into your community and do your part, I don't know what will. His story is so touching to me because we all have that, why am I here in us? Why am I on earth and what am I going to do to make this world a better place? And he chose to serve his community. And what I always say is you don't have to do something grand like start a nonprofit or be a mayor of a small town. You could do something small like hold a door open for someone or smile at someone who looks like they might be having a bad day. So often I go through a drive through and someone sees me and they say, oh, your, your coffee is already paid for by the person in front of you. So doing just those little acts of kindness really can spread. And so what I would like to tell you is sometime today or tomorrow, do something. Do just one little act of kindness, and if everybody logged on right now does just one thing, it will really grow pretty quickly. I was doing a library presentation up in Guttenberg last fall, and I showed this video doing a little extra, and a gentleman in the audience raised his hand and he said, well, I don't know if this counts, but I volunteer my time at the local elementary school, and I teach second graders how to tie their shoes. And I thought to myself, that's genius. Oh my God, I wish that I had someone at my son's elementary school that would teach him how to tie his shoes. It seems like such a small thing, but for the life of me, I could not get that seven-year-old to do what he needed to, to tie his shoes. So I was overjoyed. And I think that the gentleman thought that I was a little bit crazy, but then he realized that I'm trying to juggle so many things with having a successful business and teaching my kids and you know the list goes on laundry dinner dishes i'm sure everyone is thinking about their list right now of things they need to do after this presentation but i said thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you for all the moms and dads out there that don't have the extra time to sit down and teach their seven-year-old how to tie shoes so no matter what it is that you think might be your little bit extra there is always something that you can do. Use your imagination. You can do something to make a small impact or a big impact on somebody's life. All you have to do is think of it, be bold, and do it. Our next video is about an amazing woman up in Northern Iowa who, she's a veteran from the Vietnam era, and she decided on September 11th that she wanted to do something to help give back to the community. It's now blossomed into a full-fledged project. People travel from all over the country to Fonda, Iowa, to come see her and be honored when they have a family member who has fallen in the line of service. So here's what Betty Nielsen is doing in our communities. So today we're headed up to Fonda, Iowa. We're gonna meet up with a lady named Betty Nielsen who started a group called Freedom Quilts. 
I started Freedom Quilt because my heart is for this country. Freedom Quilt started the night of 9-11. And I kept saying to God, what can I do? And he told me, make quilts for my children are suffering. How are you? The first um, soldier that we're going to recognize and, and their family is Kyle Thomas. Somebody to take the time to make these beautiful quilts with every little stitch of love. Thinking about my son and who he was. It's a memory. It's a memory of their loved ones. I think that's just such an inspirational story. And I forgot to warn everybody at the beginning of this presentation that if you don't have any Kleenex nearby, you might want to grab one because some of this content can be pretty emotional. I even get emotional while I'm making the videos and I've seen it a hundred times already. So you've been warned now. But I found Betty to be so inspirational because she took one small moment in her life and one little calling to do something big and it's grown into this huge project that the entire community gets involved and I just love that she takes the time to put so much care and effort into her project. I love that I get to go to these small towns and just tell a story that nobody's ever heard before and then other people can say wow look at what that person's doing that's amazing and maybe inspire some of you to do something in your communities. All it really takes is a little bit of time and inspiration and before you know it you'll be doing things that you had no idea. Think about the time that we all spent in quarantine. I know that I spent most of my days binge watching TV and eating and drinking. I really didn't make the best use of my time because I allowed for that isolation to get me down. And I'm sure there's a lot of people watching right now that are like, preach it. So now is my time, now that I can see things a little bit more clearly, to start doing the outreach. One thing that I do as part of my nonprofit is I go and do this presentation in high schools and colleges and libraries and all kinds of places that will have me across the state. And then the next day, we interview the veterans. What I really love is when the high schoolers get involved. This next video was actually conducted by a couple of Johnston High School students who wanted to know more about what it was like to be a woman in the military. So I brought in one of my veteran friends from Johnston and she sat down with these girls and told them all about her life and what it was like to be deployed to Afghanistan and just really a lot about what it really truly means to be a female veteran. And I appreciated her taking her time and being candid about her experiences. And I think that those high school students really learned some great lessons on that day. The next video that I'm going to show you is the interview from that day and what I made out of it for the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum. They're just now working on an exhibit about the global war on terror and there's about a 10 video series all about the different aspects. One of them is with our next veteran and she talks about the female engagement teams that we participated in in Afghanistan. You don't know what to expect because it could be a very volatile situation. We were doing something that we call COIN. And COIN stands for counterinsurgency. Really what we were trying to do is, I mean, obviously there are bad actors out there and we were trying to get at the insurgency piece of it. Why are they in getting involved in that insurgency? Good, yeah, you can also bring the driver. They were called female engagement teams. They would go on mission with the infantry, would go in and talk to the women. We say, hey, what's going on in your community? What do you need? What do your kids need? We're seeing the men kind of, you know, flock toward this insurgency piece. What's going on there and how can we help? We all just blend because we all have the same 
uniform on, we all have the same gear on, we're all wearing helmets, we're all wearing eye protection. It would take a while because we'd go to the elders in the village and be like, hey, we'd like to talk to the females. And, they, and they'd look at us like, you're kind of crazy. And then we'd take our helmets off and our eye pro off and they'd be like, oh my gosh, you're a female, what are you doing out here? You shouldn't be out here, right? You know, it should be females as being soldiers, what's this craziness? And um, then they'd kind of get over their shock. So we'd collect all the females in one central location. An Afghan uh, female came up and she puts one on a hand on either side of my face and my head and she kind of pulls me to her and she kisses me on the forehead. And I'm in my and I'm, I'm thinking this is either going to be really good or this is going to be really bad, right? But the interpreter said she wants you to know that she is glad that you're here, that she knows that with you being here, meaning not just me personally, but the military as a whole being here, where it will help them and will help make their community a, a safer, a better place for everybody. It struck me actually, I think after I got home and was thinking about it, was like how big the world is, right? I was, you know, seven, eight thousand miles away. Almost everything is different, right? But the women were talking about the same thing there that, you know, moms are talking about the same thing there that moms here talk about, right? Health care for their kids, um, jobs, education, um, good homes. And so I think it's this, you know, with this, this great big huge world and, and there are a lot of differences. We all have a lot of differences. When you really get down to it, it's pretty amazing how similar we really are. It's always so interesting to see different parts of the world and how people live in these other parts of the world. It's crazy for us as Americans to think what it would be like for a, to be a woman and not be allowed to talk in public or even talk to another man who's not a family member. But in certain places, that's the norm. And as military members, we go in and we respect that. I also found it very interesting that she talked about how we're all the same. That's really the big takeaway that I get from this video is no matter where you are from in the world, we all have this similarity that's humankind. So no matter where you are, you want for your children to be cared for and you want to have a home and you want to have security. And that's all that we are is just humans all living on this earth. And so that's why I like to share that video is because it really drives home that no matter how different we are, we are all the same. With any project or nonprofit, there's always a time where you kind of start questioning, why am I doing this? Why am I, you know, toiling day after day for pennies, fighting over scraps of money that's grant money? And why am I putting myself through this? And then I look back at my veterans and I look back at the videos and I think, they're the reason why I keep doing this. It's not for accolades or to be a presenter at a really great conference, but to share their stories. I don't do this for me, I do this for them. And when I was working on the project up in Sioux City, I was reminded by Rich Huseman. And now I'm going to show you a little bit more from that video that really drives home why why we continue to tell these stories even after the veterans are passed away. I heard a saying once that a person actually dies twice. The first time is when their soul leaves their body here on earth, and the second time is the last time that their name is spoken out loud. So through my project with a veteran's perspective, I'm able to keep these not just stories going, but the veterans who lived these stories. Because when you watch your next video, you'll realize that we're remembering some of the people that may have been forgotten. We say in the Army, never leave a fallen comrade. And it's tough some days. Corp Tyndall died trying to save another soldier. As you think about that, about that person, a uh, beautiful wife, kid. 
Corp Tyndall was a mentor of mine, and uh, I, uh, I won't see him again for a while. The first time I went to the Vietnam Wall, my son was at the Naval Academy, and he went with me. And uh, I wouldn't let them come with me the first time. I had had them wait at the end of one of the wings of the wall, and I went there. I was knelt down in front of his name, and I was openly sobbing like a baby. And I felt these. Hands on my shoulder. It was other Vietnam vets. I was tracing across the names, looking for Corbin C. Tyndall from the Mars. And when I touched his name, I burst into tears. And I stood there, helpless, absolutely out of control, tears streaming down my face. I, I couldn't believe this happened to me. And I moved on to the next one, Ron Buchanan uh, from Sioux City. And I, I just cried and cried and went through all the rest of them. And then I said, what, what in hell happened to me? What, what is it about this place? And then there was the realization. It was like the soldiers are behind that wall. And when you touch their name, they reach out and they touch your finger to say thank you. Thank you for remembering. I go to daily mass and uh, I pray for them every day. Sometimes we say, we'll never forget, just like we did after September 11th. We said, we'll never forget. But how many people right now know that we're still at war? There are people in the military right now that have never known an America that wasn't at war. They're 18 years old. And September 11th happened 19 years ago. We're coming up on, 20, on the 20th anniversary next year and we are still at war. So ask your average person or think about, when's the last time that you thanked a veteran? We have Veterans Day coming up next month. Maybe do some small part in your community to thank a veteran. Send them a thank you card up to the veteran's home or donate to a nonprofit that supports veterans. I might know one. But just keep in mind that one small thing that you do can really empower someone else. Now's the time for us to start reaching out into the community and doing good in the world. There are so many opportunities and so many nonprofits out there that need help both financially and through donations. There are things you can do from home that will help an organization more than you may ever even know. Such small organizations just don't have grant money this year. And so you can do something different. You can raise awareness. You can start a campaign, you can do a fundraiser on your own. But what we shouldn't be doing is sitting at home and feeling sorry for ourselves. Because everybody has a story to share and everybody has a reason to be upset. But those same people also have reasons to be bold and be thankful and be grateful and to thank others in their lives for being a part of it. Be thankful that you have food on your table. Be thankful that you have a home to live in. There are so many amazing things going on in your life. You just have to see them for what they are and then use that to do something more. So thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you logging on and being a part of my breakout session. Now, if you have any questions, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you guys and I will be here to answer them.